Today we're going to talk about Rutherford scattering and the nuclear radius. Now there's many models of the atom and generally what we do is we take the simplest one that's going to suit our needs. And for right now the simplest one that suits our needs is the Rutherford model. And there's certain key features to the Rutherford model and I just want to make sure that you know what they are. The first one is that there's electrons that circle the nucleus. So these bluish circles here are to represent the electrons and they're negatively charged. This thing in the center here, that would be the nucleus. Now inside the nucleus we've got what are called nucleons. And there's two types of nucleons. There's protons and there's neutrons. And the nucleons and the protons they're similar particles because they basically have the identical mass. The difference being in their charge. The protons, of course, have the positive charge, whereas the neutrons are neutral. They have no charge. Now, if we compare the mass of a nucleon compared to an electron, the nucleons are much, much more massive, about 2,000 times more massive. So that means all the mass is going to be concentrated in the nucleus. So we've got a nucleus that is tiny, tiny, and dense, dense. It's extremely tiny. In fact, we say that an atom is mostly empty space. The size of an atom compared to the size of a nucleus is like a marble within a football stadium. So an atom is really mostly empty space. And the other thing you need to know is that the charge is balanced. And that means the number of protons will equal the number of electrons, because a proton has just as much charge as an electron. So a proton charge is equal to an electron charge in magnitude. And the value of that charge is, of course, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And that's it. That's the basic structure of the atom. The electrons orbiting around a tiny, dense nucleus. Now the experiment that really demonstrated that the atom has to have a positively charged, very, very small, very, very dense nucleus is called the Geiger-Marsden experiment, or at least the IB likes to call it the Geiger-Marsden experiment. If you look in other textbooks, you might see it called the Rutherford experiment, or perhaps the Gold Foil experiment. So you've probably already talked about it. Geiger and Marsden were part of Rutherford's research team. They were postdoc students, and they were the ones that really conducted the experiment. Now the basic idea in this Geiger-Marsden experiment is you take a th very thin gold foil. So these are to represent gold atoms. And you're going to send in alpha particles. High speed alpha particles. So an alpha particle is simply a helium nucleus. So it's got two protons and two neutrons stuck together in a nucleus. So these alpha particles are going to come along and originally it was imagined that these atoms were uniform. And what that means is that if one of these al alpha particles blasts through, then they should all just blast through. They should just blast through like it was tissue paper there. And when they started doing this, that's what the alpha particles did. And most of them just blasted straight through and were not deflected at all. How is it that we know that we have a very tiny, positively charged, dense nucleus? Well, when the experiment was performed, it's true, most of the alpha particles just went straight through, the same way they would do if the atoms were uniform throughout. But there were some alpha particles that went off at kind of glancing angles. And that's because the alpha particle approached very, very close to the nucleus here. Remember, the alpha particle is positively charged. The gold nucleus is also positively charged. So if they get fairly close to each other, then we would get a force that's going to change the path of the alpha particle. What's also very interesting and very difficult to explain unless you have a very tiny, dense nucleus. Let's say you've got an alpha particle that's coming in directly at a nucleus here. Then it could bounce straight back. The gold nucleus, it's much heavier than the alpha particle. So it, its inertia would just keep it there. And the alpha particle would bounce straight back. And this was witnessed. Some of the alpha particles would st bounce straight back. 
and just by considering what fraction of the alpha particles bounce backwards, they could get a rough estimate as to how big the nucleus has to be. Very quick IB question on the Geiger Marsden experiment. Pause the video, read it over, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer, and hopefully you said the Geiger Marsden experiment verified that there is a very dense, positively charged nucleus. I was saying earlier that we could use backscattering to determine about how big a nucleus is. So let's take a closer look at that right now. So we've got these positively charged alpha particles coming in. And remember they have two protons and two neutrons in them, so they really have a charge of plus two. And they're striking these gold nuclei. Gold nuclei have 79 protons and more neutrons than that, so they're a lot more massive and have a much bigger charge. Now if we only consider the alpha particles that approach head-on, then of course we're going to send them in with a certain amount of kinetic energy. And we can determine how much kinetic energy we want to send the alpha particles in with by accelerating them through parallel plates. So we accelerate them, give them a certain amount of kinetic energy, and they would approach that nucleus, eventually momentarily come to a stop, then they'd turn around and go back again. Well, at this point here of closest approach, we can say that the loss of kinetic energy will be equal to the gain in electric potential energy. And we'll know how much kinetic energy was lost because it's going to lose all that kinetic energy that it gained when it accelerated through the plates. And then our gain in electric potential energy will simply be given by Coulomb's constant times the product of the two charges, that is the two protons from the alpha particle and the 79 protons from the gold nucleus, divided by that distance of closest approach. This is our formula for electric potential energy between charges. This would be our distance of closest approach. So what we're going to do though is keep increasing the kinetic energy. And if we do that, eventually there won't be any more backscattering. And the reason for that is that when nucleons get very, very close to each other, there's a new force that dominates the Coulomb repulsion. It's called the strong nuclear force. It's a strong, attractive force, but it's extremely short range. So basically what happens is that if our alpha particle here gets on what we'd call the edge of the nucleus. There is no real edge, but that's the place where the strong nuclear force begins to dominate over the Coulomb repulsion. So remember, protons repel each other, so there's no way for a nucleus to be stable unless there's another force that's dominating the Coulomb repulsion, and that force is the strong nuclear force. So basically what happens is we keep increasing the kinetic energy. Eventually, we get no more backscattering because the backscattering was due to the Coulomb repulsion. And now that's being dominated by this attractive strong nuclear force. So, no more backscattering. So then we set up this equation here. We will know how much kinetic energy was lost. We know Coulomb's constant. We know the values of the charges. What we can do is solve for that R. And that R should be the radius of the nucleus. In a sense, it's not really a radius. It's really just a location where the strong nuclear force begins to dominate the Coulomb repulsion. But it'll give us a sense of how big a nucleus is. OK, here's a simulation to show what I mean. So we're going to send in an alpha particle. It's going to hit a gold nucleus. The red is the alpha particle. The gold nucleus is the yellow in the center. We're going to give the alpha particle a certain amount of kinetic energy, in this case 10 MeVs of kinetic energy. So we send it in. This is one that's approaching head-on. It has a certain distance of closest approach, and then it would bounce back again. So if we crank up our kinetic energy to 20 MeVs and send it in, of course it gets a lot closer. It's getting very close to the edge of the nucleus. And if I go up to 25 and send it in, it's right at the very edge of the nucleus. And now if I go up to 26 
and send it in, I get an error message. Energy must be less than 26. So 26 is the place where, experimentally, I wouldn't see any backscattering. And that's because the strong nuclear force is beginning to take over. So experimentally, of course, we'd be sending in millions and millions of these alpha particles. We'd just look at the backscattering data, the alpha particles that came straight back. And we'd keep increasing the kinetic energy. And at some point, we wouldn't get any more backscattering. And that would imply that our alpha particle had got right to the edge of the nucleus. And now what we're going to do is the mathematics and solve for the size of the nucleus. So now let's use that value of 26 MeVs, because that's how much kinetic energy our alpha particle lost when it got to that position of closest approach. And on the other side of the equation, we've got the gain in electric potential energy. And that's simply given by K times the product of the charges divided by R. And R should be roughly equal to the radius of the nucleus. Now, of course, this equation here, that's in joules. This is MeV. So we've got to do a conversion here and convert the MeVs to joules. So we're going to have to multiply by 10 to the 6. That would be the number of EVs per mega EV. And then we've got to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. That's the number of joules in an EV. So that we're going to get units of joules on this side of the equation. Now on the other side of the equation, we've got Coulomb's constant, 9 times 10 to the 9th. This is going to be the charge of the alpha particle. Remember, that's two protons compared to the gold nucleus, which has 79 protons. So two protons, each proton has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and then 79 protons, each with a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulombs. And then on the bottom, what we want to solve for is the radius. We can cross out one of those elementary charges, and then we can solve for the radius, or the distance of closest approach. And if you do that, you should get an answer of 9 times 10 to the negative 15 meters. We're really only doing an order of magnitude estimate, but somewhere between 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 15 meters. And it's generally taken to be 10 to the minus 15 meters. And remember I said that the size of a nucleus compared to the size of the atom is like a marble in a football stadium. Well, the size of an atom, typically about 10 to the minus 10. Size of a nucleus, 10 to the minus 15. So that means the atom is about 100,000 times bigger than the nucleus, which is roughly the same scale ratio between the diameter of a football stadium and the diameter of a marble. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.